do accept the, our apologies about the bulletins. That's never happened here. We usually have much more serious catastrophes uh, early on Sunday morning. So you've been very understanding, and I'm, I'm sorry about that. And I'm glad that Rob got liberated from subway purgatory. I don't know who you paid or what you paid, but you got here, so welcome. So back to school. I'm going back to school. All the excitement on Thursday, the crowded subways, the loud voices in the coffee shops, the gaggles all walking around talking to each other at the same time in loud pitched voices, high pitched voices, they all made me realize that I was jealous. I wanted that sleepless Wednesday night most of them had. I wanted to be so excited about what I was going to do the next day that I couldn't sleep had brand new stuff, going to have brand new experiences, and I was ready for the new and the next. And the reason I wanted to go back to school is I wanted to learn how to restore the joy of my salvation. How many of you know this Create in Me a Clean Heart? Oh, God, Psalm. Well, fewer than usual. It's something that is really almost ground into the experience spiritually of some people, but not all people. And in my growing up tradition of Lutheranism, the organ would grind that thing out. You know, it would real start way low. Ooh, create in me a clean heart, oh God. It was just very... Uh, Bach turned dismal. <laughs> but you never forget it. You know, you just never forget the words. And in the original, it's create in me a pure heart, oh God. But you've noticed we've gotten rid of that. Um, and for good reasons, good theological reasons, that clean and dirty are often used, pure and impure are used very inappropriately against people. So these days it is translated, create in me a new heart, a back to school heart, a heart that can't sleep at night because something wonderful is going to happen. And I wanted so much to be restored to a kind of joy and then I had to face straight into the fact that I've kind of given up on being restored. I'm not a chair, you can't take me down to my original and then buff me up. I'm not a building like Judson where you can take the whole roof off. It's not up there right now. There's no roof above your heads right now. I, I'm not like a big, beautiful, ancient landmark building that can be restored piece by piece, hammer by hammer. Uh, can't happen. So restoration seems to happen to chairs and school kids and other people, but it's not been happening to me lately, and I think it can happen. I've seen it happen. I want to be restored spiritually, and I know I have to want it. And what I think most of us want these days is just not to lose anything more. We can't lose any more respect for our country. As Ted's drawing on the front of the bulletin slyly suggests in its meditation quote and picture of Lady Liberty as our guest expressed, the quote has nothing to do with the status of the statue. In fact, the quote and the statue are like this. They don't match, and there they are, right on the front page of the bulletin we couldn't find. But the quote is pretty clear, isn't it? America is much too good for the untalented, the broken, the slob. From now on, we'll just shop the globe for the stuff we can use. And let, I love that word, let, let them those talented people in. We don't need any more garbage around here. 
So my first course, when I go back to restoration school, has to be managing my expectations. Dare I hope in that statue anymore? Or am I just being a fool? People who want nothing more than to lose nothing else are very unlikely to experience the joy of salvation. They, we, have already been cast or have cast ourselves, self-cast ourselves away from thy presence. We've actually self-cast ourselves in a really lousy movie right when the sound of music is playing at the cinema next door. We already have salvation, you see. We have not been cast out of the presence of God, even if we're not talented enough to be led into the country today. There's always tomorrow for us. We have the chance at a new heart and a new spirit, a right one, and so do people with priors and people whose hearts have been broken and people who don't know how to read even in their own language. But today is less a sermon about sanctuary than it is about salvation, but they are connected. Sanctuary, as the Sound of Music movie showed us, is one route to salvation. I was watching that old favorite a few weeks ago with my grandchildren ages nine, seven, and four, and they'd never seen it. They've seen a lot of movies, too. But I knew they had heard a word or two about the Nazis because they go to a Jewish school, the Luria Academy in Brooklyn. And I was shocked, as I usually am, when I see an old movie from a new angle. Maybe everybody else got this, but I didn't get it yet. The nuns in the movie were providing physical sanctuary. I just never saw it that way before. The Von Trapp family had become illegal overnight. They weren't following the state's orders. Where else to go but to a church? And the rest of the story, as you know, is one of dangerous safety, which is exactly what salvation is. Salvation is dangerous safety. Or perhaps sanctuary is dangerous salvation. Salvation is not about having fewer fears or being chased less by the cops. It's the capacity to outlive and outrun and outhide and outtrick the fears. So what makes us lower our expectations, which is, by the way, always a good management strategy, manage expectations, but rarely a good spiritual one. What makes us lower our expectations is how devastated we are by disappointments. What besmirchment has happened to the American dream? What mental illness and spiritual illness resides in the White House? How low we have gone in imprisoning children and separating them from their families when we should be singing songs to them about how alive the hills are with the sound of music. At any rate, my kids love the movie, and even Judah, age four, wants do re mi played loudly at breakfast. So Psalm 51 and its chants, its multiple chances, which are not all dirges, thank you, choir, Psalm 51 rates high on my back-to-school curriculum. The psalm is one of my favorites and also one of Amy Harbo's favorites. Amy has said that the psalm gives her a way to acknowledge that her current heart is not quite right and that she needs a new one. She, it also acknowledges that sometimes we just don't have the right spirit. You can be doing the right thing and not have the right spirit. And so it's a sly form of confession. We acknowledge that we need a new heart and a new spirit and somehow imagine if, if we had the right heart and the right spirit, we would find ourselves joyfully saved. Instead of feeling far away from God, cast away, cast out, we would feel the joy of our salvation. And all these things are implied in the psalm, not said straight out. 
See, we don't say we've got a bad heart, we just ask for a new one. We don't say we've got a wrong spirit, we just ask for a new one. And we imagine a cycle of restoration that once these things happen to us, the new heart, the new spirit, we will feel less cast aside spiritually and more joyful about how secure we really are in the first place. And I almost find the psalm impolite. It's almost like telling God what to do. If I were to ask Grace, sorry to single you out, I'm just gonna play a game with you. If I were to say, Grace, create in me a new heart, please. I'd say please, wouldn't I? I wouldn't just say create in me a new heart, damn it. And the other lines too, restore unto me the joy of your salvation. Wouldn't I say please? Restore unto me the joy of your salvation, or please don't cast me out. But instead, there is a dynamic of confidence in the psalm, almost as if, if we but tell God what to do, God will do it. If we tell God what we need, God will provide it. We are slyly admitting in the chanting of the psalm that we don't feel very safe or secure or saved and we'd like to feel more so. Whether the season is all back to school, or mud season, or winter, remember winter? The kind that never ends. So I don't know what you do with a psalm that you think is discourteous at a certain level, and also beautiful, and also what you have this muscle memory for, some of us at least. I don't know about you, but I find it hard to receive the gift of this joyful salvation right now. It really bothers me that we have climate deniers and now Bahamians joining Puerto Ricanos in unbelievable weather-driven insecurity. Restore unto them water. We'll get to salvation later. So it's a season of great discontent, a time when there is no security coming from the state whose only function, we're told, is to protect its citizens. By the way, as Captain Von Trapp knows only too well, the state has a habit of substituting its version of security for that of Lady Liberty. We're not those people. We think there is real security. Marianne Brissat and Fred Brissat, former members of this congregation now out in California, are building new ways to be spiritual people. They have pioneered a gorgeous website for an online delivery system for religious education. They're post-denominational, post-religious, post-secular, like many of us here. And religion specializes in renewal. It renews by guaranteeing forgiveness and postulating hope. It is all second and 72nd new chances all the time. And they're working on a new certificate in spiritual literacy, just like the one that Harvard Divinity School did on religious literacy. And they're talking a lot about the centrality of renewal and restoration to religious thought. And what they're finding and what people want to hear online and toe dippers and amateurs and people who never heard this beautiful psalm, what people want to hear is there is a way for us to become new. There is a way to restore ourselves even Reverend Haggard can be restored. We don't want to think that he's just condemned, do we? I know, I know, I know. I always get in trouble when I ask that question. Well, maybe just for a couple of years or decades, right? But once we start saying that about creeps like him, And, and what about, what about the, what about people like you? What about people falsely accused? What about people who get killed on a street for 
selling a cigarette. Where does it stop? Where does it start? How important is this new heart to all of us? I think it's more than important. It's essential. So let me conclude now with a kind of problem. Remember I said salvation is dangerous and that you've got to be educated and shaped and formed and storied and saturated with stories to even be able to begin to think about restoration. Salvation is dangerous and works when it helps you solve problems, not when it lets you avoid problems. Salvation goes through, not around. So I've got this tennis partner, Vicki. She lives in an uptown co-op, which means she's an owner of the co-op. And the management told her that she had to take her large and precious collection of tropical plants off her outside deck. And she had to do it in two weeks. And she was heartbroken, said, I can't redistribute these plants, some of them very mature. I can't do it in two weeks. Give me some time. They said, no, the scaffolding's going up. The scaffolding's still not up. And she had to get rid of all her plants. And she said, well, you know, I've been thinking about a possible lawsuit because I'm so upset and they were so valuable. But then again, we own the co-op and I guess I'd be suing myself. Maybe my issue is really that I'm in the democratic doldrums, because we own the co-op. We own the co-op. Management can tell us to get rid of precious things all it wants to. <laughs> it can enforce things that are bad for us and bad for plants and bad for children and bad for everything, but we own the co-op. We're not to be managed, and our ideas are not to be managed. We are owned by salvation so that we can own it. And like I said, I'm going back to school to find out exactly how tomorrow. Amen.